thanks so much for coming. I'm really glad that you are also excited about traveling on a budget. It's something that I'm really passionate about and I'm excited to share with you all. So as Rex mentioned, my name is Jessica Mestre Jeffrey. I'm one of your honors advisors. And uh, here we go, we're gonna jump right in. So this is the selection of topics we'll be covering today. So the largest chunk will be money saving strategies. It's a pretty broad subject, so I broke it down for you where to go and when, kind of what a budget might entail, finding flights, finding accommodation, how you might save money with food, and some different volunteer opportunities as well. Then we'll move on to hostels, sort of demystifying what they are, because I feel like a lot of people, especially in the US, are either scared of them or maybe only know kind of what stereotypes are of hostels and don't really know what they're like in reality. Then we'll move on to some helpful apps and sites and wrap up with sort of odds and ends um, as well as your questions so you're welcome to jump in at any point with questions or if you have any at the end or want to follow up with me afterwards that's totally fine as well so why am i talking to you all about this uh, other than the fact that i am very passionate about travel i am also a very seasoned traveler so my first sort of significant independent international experience was in the summer between my sophomore and junior year when I got an internship in Uruguay at a nonprofit. 10 weeks, I was the first international intern there. Spoke Spanish the whole time. Great way to learn Spanish. Um, so basically since that point till now, I've visited 41 countries. I am gonna focus on mostly international experiences today, but a lot of what I'm talking about can apply to domestic travel as well. So in case you wanted to follow up about any specific destinations, I spent a semester in Spain a month backpacking in Western Europe after that semester, as well as a month in Cuba. And then the main experience that you'll see some pictures from is 10 months backpacking in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Um, so basically, yeah, I saved money for a lot of a long time, quit my job, traveled for 10 months, and then found this job because I needed to replenish that baby. <laughs> um, and on that trip, I was the only one who did all those 10 months. Um, about half of the time split um, throughout I was by myself and about half of the time I was with either my husband or a cousin or an old co-worker or a travel group it was really mixed a friend from college and her sister so you never know who you might want to travel with um, but throughout that I'm always budget conscious for sure uh, Rex likes to call me Jessica no dollar signs best Trey Jeffrey um, and I'm proud of it yeah I am it. Um, and then I mentioned that, that I enjoy solo travel so I don't only do solo travel. Um, my husband will want me to make sure you know that I enjoy traveling with him. <laughs> um, but I also really like solo travel. It's a very unique experience. It's very empowering, especially as a woman. I think a lot of people are scared to travel by yourself as a woman. So please don't be afraid to do so. I'm happy to talk to you about that as well. This was um, my top nine from the year that I went on that trip. Um, you're welcome to check out more details on Instagram at Jessica the Adventurer semi-shameless plug, but also I actually did a lot of reflecting while I was on that trip. So you can actually learn a decent amount if you're interested in backpacking in Africa, Asia, or Latin America. All right, so jumping into those money-saving strategies. First, where, you're gonna choose where to go and when. So you could go about this in a few ways. You could ask, probably the most standard question is, where do I wanna go? What do I wanna see? That's one way to go about it. You could kind of work backwards and say, how much money do I have and what can I do with that? You could also say, when am I available and for how long and kind of what makes sense to see in that time frame, or how far does it make sense to go? If I only have a week, does it make sense to fly across an ocean or does it make more sense to stay within my region or go within the US, something like that. You also wanna take into consideration the season. So is this a nice time to visit that place? Or if it's not, am I gonna be okay with boiling or freezing? Um, if it is a nice time to be there, then it's probably considered high season, which means that the prices will probably be higher and the crowds will probably be larger as well. So you just have to weigh whether you are okay with that or whether you'd rather kind of go off the beaten path, go at a time that's more of a shoulder season, so that's in between high and low season. Um, that's usually a sweet spot to go is shoulder season. Um, and then another thing, if you are willing to go off the beaten path, just know that it may be a little bit harder to do that information gathering. So the popular places are popular and there's a lot of information out there. So if you're going off the beaten path, just know that you might have a few more uncertainties to navigate along the way. All right. OK, 
Okay, so before we dive into the specifics of how to save money, basically what money might you be spending, right? So you wanna go into it mindfully, prepare your budget. These are sort of the main four things that come to mind when you're thinking of your daily expenses. So where am I going to sleep? What am I going to eat and drink? What am I going to do? It's probably gonna have a cost associated with that as well. And also how am I going to get around within the area, whether that's within your city or between cities or between adjacent countries. Um, so those are sort of the daily things that you would wanna factor in. Then you have your occasional costs that ultimately as you're thinking of your budget, you're gonna to wanna to factor in, but um, you know, are gonna vary a lot. So when you buy that one transatlantic or whatever flight, that's gonna be a big purchase relative to your daily expenses, expenses right? Also, if you're buying a bunch of gear, say, um, you don't literally have to use a backpack, but it can be really handy to have you know, a good backpack that's gonna be a nice size for you and fit you well and not break along the way. I've had people's backpack straps break and it's heartbreaking. Um, you know, preparing any gear, so, you know, a quick drying travel towel is one that I definitely recommend that if you're going to be going to hostels or traveling for long amounts of time, invest in a towel that's going to pack really small and dry really quickly. So that's an example of like uh, the preparation expenses. And then travel insurance is a whole other topic that we can talk more about if you have questions, but basically I recommend you look into it. I think that it seems like a luxury, especially when you're on a college budget, but if you're thinking about how much money you're investing and how something could change if you you know, have a debilitating injury and you can't go, or your travel partner can't go, or there's a hurricane, or you have a medical incident and you can't get the care that you need and you haven't got insurance for medical evacuation. So these are things that, these are reasons you would wanna consider and I, I encourage you to buy travel insurance. And then also just sort of odds and ends. If you don't have a passport, getting a passport, getting it far in advance. If you need visas to go where you're going, that's gonna cost money things like that, vaccines, things that are sort of odds and ends that wouldn't fit into these other categories. Oh, and this is a website that I haven't personally used, but I came across while I was doing research for this presentation. It seems legit, budgetyourtrip.com, at least a good starting point. If not, you know, your end all be all, it'll be food for thought. I also wanted to point out that your budget will vary widely based on where you're going. So Western Europe, Australia, Iceland, things like that are gonna be sort of your most expensive destinations. If you wanna to go to Europe, but you wanna be more budget friendly, Eastern Europe is probably your best bet. Um, Southeast Asia is a very budget friendly location. Um, these are just two selections from different bloggers I found online. Basically this is, these, I know it's really small print, but these are places where this particular person went. So you can see it ranges anywhere from Laos, which was $21.76 a day on average, to Ireland, which was $63.17 a day. So definitely something you need to keep in mind. She also mentioned a few notes that, you know, Amsterdam normally wouldn't be $27.85 a day, but she got two weeks of free house sitting, which saved her on accommodation, things like that. And then this is from a different site, just to give you again, an, uh, an, some examples of the vast array of price points. So anywhere from $20 a day in Bolivia, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, to $65 a day in Japan, France, and Ireland. So something that you really wanna be mindful of as you're choosing where you're going, how long, things like that. All right, so moving on to finding flights. Finding flights can definitely be a place to save money. Um, so one thing you wanna do is to track itineraries. So my go-to is Google Flights. If I know where I wanna go, or if I have specific dates in mind, I'm gonna start there and basically see kind of what's out there and set alerts. So there's a button that just says like, set alert or set notification or something like that. So it'll notify you when the price changes, when it goes up, when it goes down. I think sometimes it even says like, this looks like a good time to buy, <laughs> things like that. So start there. Ideally, you're doing this far enough in advance where you have time to get those messages, right? So you wanna see how things are changing over time. Um, also, there are a few websites or a few affiliation pages on Facebook that I've found to be really helpful. There's one called Scott's Cheap Flights up here in the corner and travelpirates.com. These are ones that are mostly known for letting you know about um, mistake fares or just really good deals in general. So for example, through Scott's Cheap Flights, I was able to find a round trip ticket for a week during spring break though. So my dates were fixed to spring break. It was a round trip from Detroit, which is where I lived at the time, to Paris 
for $340. I mean, that's less than you would pay for a lot of domestic flights, especially during spring break. So at that point, the way I approached that was, these are the dates that I have. I'm gonna look out for the best deal and choose my destination based on the best deal. So that alert said, prices are great for Amsterdam, Paris, Rome, and London. And basically I looked at my husband and said, where do you wanna go of those four places? And he said, let's go to Paris. So that's where we went because that was the availability of the flights. I always set these to, to show first in my feed because these deals you have to jump on immediately. Originally we were gonna to go to Iceland for like 500 something and I saw it at lunch and I was gonna to talk to him at the end of the day and by that time it was gone. So literally this time when I found it, one second, when I found it, I called him and I said, are we on board? And I booked it 10 minutes later. So you just have to be on top of it. Did you have a question? Oh, okay. Um, so tracking itineraries, planning ahead when possible. So three months ahead is sort of a landmark where if you're flying domestically, starting the process then is pretty realistic. If you're flying internationally, that's kind of last minute. So you wanna be planning more than three months ahead for an international flight, if you can. Um, obviously, if you find a mistake fare for next week, go for it, right? But typically, last week prices are gonna be about 25% inflated over what you're normally seeing. One other tip is to look for multi-city itineraries, which are also called open jaw. So let's say um, I wanted to fly from Orlando to London, spend some time seeing London, take the tunnel to Paris, spend some time seeing Paris, and then fly from Paris back to Orlando. That's a great way to cover ground um, and kind of use your transit strategically. Sometimes it doesn't work out price-wise, but sometimes it can be the same price or even less. So definitely something to look out for. In Google, you can just select like multi-city and then it allows you to enter those cities. Um, also trying different days of the week. It can be harder when you're on a college schedule, but maybe after you've graduated and you have the flexibility to fly on a Tuesday or Wednesday, which are the, generally the cheapest days, you can go for that. Um, Saturdays are typically least expensive after Tuesdays and Wednesdays. Again, that's just a rule of thumb. So if you're setting those dates and you wanna check out like a calendar, um, that's something to look for. That reminds me, in Google, if you're looking for, you have dates but you're not sure where you wanna go, there's actually a map function where you can say, show me all the flights from Orlando on these dates and it'll show you a map of the world and show you all the different rates. So definitely some great tools out there. And then finally, just watch out for some pitfalls. Luggage can be expensive. It can be $100 or more for a standard piece of luggage. So watch out for that. They can really get you with those prices and then slap them on at the end. And then you're like, that really wasn't that great of a deal after all. Um, also watch out for short layovers. If it's 30 minutes, 45 minutes, I wouldn't recommend taking that itinerary. You're probably gonna miss your flight. Personally, I aim for at least two hours, especially if I'm in another country, if I might have to go through uh, a passport control or something like that. Just be really mindful of the short itineraries. That might be why it's so cheap. And then also just watch out for inconveniently located airports. Sometimes there'll be like a main airport and then a little side airport where the prices are better, but it's an hour away and there may or may not be a shuttle. So then you may be paying for a really expensive taxi ride to get from that airport. So just make sure you're Googling where is this airport relative to downtown fill in the blank city. All right, so affordable accommodation. Obviously, people, when they think of most vacations, they think of hotels, right? But if you're wanting to save money, hostels are a really great way to go. I'm gonna dive into more details about that later, but there are really hostels all over the world, even more in the US than you might think. It's worth checking out if you're traveling domestically. I like to use hostelworld.com. There's also hostel bookers, I think. Hostel World is the only one that I have personal experience with. Uh, but it is easy to book online, really straightforward interface. And oftentimes you can either cancel for free or for a, like a 10 a 10 percent deposit on like a ten dollar room is really not a big deal if your plans change and you want to you know adjust on the fly. Sharing rooms is another way to go. So let's say you're traveling with a friend or even you meet someone in a hostel and you're really getting along with them and you've developed a rapport. I mean, I wouldn't do that like the day after you meet them, right? But let's say you've hung out with somebody in a city and maybe you even see them again in another city and then you're like, hey, do you wanna just share a room so we don't have to be in a dorm room? It's one way to go. I've done it before. You get more privacy, more space, and then sometimes it can even actually be cheaper than dorm rooms depending on kind of what you're going for. Also look for long-term discounts if you're going someplace for like a month, for example. Sometimes Airbnb will advertise discounts for long durations, or you can always message someone. It can't hurt to ask, excuse me, do you have any deal deals for a three week stay or a six week stay? Worst they can do is say no, right? Then 
couch surfing is one that I think scares a lot of people. I've done it a couple times, but basically um, this is where you sign up on this website, you create a profile, and then you find people who are willing to have you stay on their couch or in a guest room for free. Um, so they, there is a level of verification through their site. So if the person wants to like send an extra credential in, they have a little badge saying like verify that this is actually them, right? Um, and they also, their reviews, so I would never go to one that doesn't have reviews, things like that. But um, it, it can be a really great way to, you know, save money and meet local people who are usually pretty pumped to show you their city because why else are they hosting random people in their house, right? Um, so they, even if you don't end up staying with them, they could provide an inside scoop on their city. So sometimes you can just meet up for drinks or for lunch or whatever. Um, I will say couchsurfing can be hit or miss in terms of the feasibility of it. So I ended up not relying on it on my 10 month trip because when I found um, earlier on in my experience that I was trying to reach out, either I would reach out too soon and the people wouldn't know their availability yet or I'd reach out too late and they were already booked or they already had plans. So it can just be not as reliable. Obviously it's not as reliable. You're staying on someone's couch uh, as opposed to booking an actual room. So if you have the flexibility and you're willing to kind of roll the dice with that, go for it. I just wouldn't bank on it. All right, so food is another way that you can save money. Um, making lunches your biggest meal of the day is a great tip, especially in Western Europe. There's often a fixed menu that you can look out for. So it might say like lunch special or fixed menu. In Spanish, it's called menu del día, so like the menu of the day. In French, it's called prefixe. I think I'm saying that right, like fi fixed price. So basically what that is is for, so in this example, for 10 euro, you would get an appetizer, a main course, um, a salad, a bread, and a dessert or coffee for 10 euro. It's like, what, 11.50 now, dollars? Something like that. So that's a great deal. And then if you kind of, you know, fill up at lunchtime, you won't necessarily need as much for dinner. So good thing to look out for. If you're spending a long time traveling, like I did for my 10 months, if you're going to places where you can't drink the tap water, um, so I would say if you're spending a lot of time in Southeast Asia and Latin America and Africa, investing in water purification, I'd highly recommend. Um, this is the one I use. It's a UV filter. It, I don't understand the science of it. It feels like magic because literally you dip these little sensors into the water and then this light turns on. It's like a blue color and you hold it in until it starts flashing and then your water is safe to drink. I never got sick using it. <laughs> So this itself is $85, but if you buy a bottle of water every day, it's gonna add up really quickly if you're traveling for a long time and it's USB rechargeable. So worth looking into either something like that or like a water bottle that strains your water. It was a mistake that I definitely made in my long-term trip. Uh, I didn't get it until really like two thirds of the way through and I wish I'd had it the whole time. And then finally, um, really not underestimating the power of the grocery store. So either going in and buying prepared foods or going in and buying stuff like this that you're like, hey, this looks fun. I mean, as long as you're getting enough nutrients, right? I wouldn't just eat that as all of your meals. But, you know, trying new things that, you know, it's a dollar or two, it's a cool experience. And then if you're meeting people at the hostel, you can either go grocery shopping together or you could, you know, prepare like a ramen dish or this is, there's this YouTube video about preparing fried rice in like a teapot kettle pretty impressive. Um, but yeah, so you, you would really be surprised how much you can save by instead of going out to dinner two or three times in one week, doing something simple like a sort of makeshift picnic or something in your hostel. And you will see people doing this at hostels, so you will not be the only one. And you can go in on that together and prepare the food together, what have you. All right, so lastly, volunteer opportunities can be a great way to save on accommodation and or food, depending on the situation. What I'll describe is sort of the um, structure of these sites that I have here and then go into the specifics. So basically the idea of these sites is that you pay a small fee, typically like 30 to $50, to become a member of this website. You create a profile and then you can view other profiles of hosts who are looking for volunteers. So for example, um, on this site, most on the left, Workaway, that can be anywhere from nonprofits to families to schools, community projects, sustainable projects, farms, uh, animal welfare, things like that. They run the gamut and you can search by location, you can search by date, similar to what we've been talking about. And basically you reach out to them and see, 
Are they available then? Usually there's a calendar even with their availability and you just find a good fit for you. Um, this could be something as specific as, you know, oh, I'm an environmental studies major and I want to work on an environmental studies project. Or it can be as simple as uh, I'm a native English speaker and this family really wants a native English speaker in their house so that their children feel more comfortable speaking English. Like literally you could get free accommodation to spend five hours a day in this family's home speaking English and then they have a place for you to stay. Sometimes they'll feed you some meals and they'll give you that local insight. It's, it's a more personal experience. So I've been speaking about Workaway on the left. In the middle, this is a worldwide organization of organic farms. Same concept, but only with organic farms. I did this for a week in Poland. I know nothing about farming, uh, but I basically like weeded some gardens and stacked some wood and cooked some food. It was fine. <laughs> and then um, on Prakash is the page that I just found out about recently, actually through a student. Um, one of our honor students is planning to volunteer in Indonesia this summer using this website. So I don't have any personal experience with it, but he's had a great experience in the preparation phase anyway. All right, any questions so far? All right, so we're gonna move on to hostels. Again, my hope for this is to provide like a realistic perspective on this, but really help you just sort of debunk any concerns or mysteries you might have about them because they're really not bad places to stay if you do your research and make educated decisions about them. So what is a hostel anyway? Inexpensive lodging, um, I would say, is the most common characteristic. Originally, more geared towards young people, like oftentimes you'll even see youth hostel, but I've seen many old people in hostels and middle-aged people, so it's totally fine um, to you know make the most of this setup at any age. There's also a wide range of bedroom and bathroom types, so you can see anywhere from a four-bedroom uh, dorm room to a 25-bedroom dorm room. I've stayed in both of those. You can do a two-bed private room where you and one person have the room to yourself, and you're not you know sharing the room with strangers. You might have an ensuite bathroom that's connected to your room. You might have a bathroom down the hall with one stall. You might have a bathroom down the hall with five stalls. It really just runs the gamut. Um, a wide range of cleanliness. Again, if you're paying attention to reviews on sites like Hostel World, which I'll talk more about in a second, there will be ratings. Is this hostel clean? Things like that. Um, they may include breakfast. I found that this varied mostly regionally. So like in Latin America, breakfast included was pretty common. In Southeast Asia, breakfast included was pretty common. In China, I never got a breakfast included. So it just really depends on kind of where you are. They also may coordinate tours or events. So that could be something as simple as like, hey, there's a happy hour tonight. Sometimes they sell food and drink at the hostel. Um, other times it's, hey, it's pretty common for four people to go see this site together. So we're gonna have signups with four slots. So come write your name on it, this board if you want. Or we have a van rented at this time. So if you'd like to join this guided tour, sign up here, that sort of thing. I've done all those and generally it's a pretty good offering. There's only really one dud that I ever did because they're not gonna keep offering it if people aren't going and people are gonna trash them in their reviews if it's a bad experience, right? And then finally, the social atmosphere, I would say, is very characteristic of a hostel. Sure, you'll find one here or there that is lower energy, maybe if it's low season, there aren't that many people around. But generally, you know, people are excited to be there. Oftentimes, they're solo travelers and they're looking to meet other people. Um, so great for extroverts, but also don't be afraid if you're an introvert. You can definitely spend a whole time in a hostel and never talk to anyone. It's really just however you want to navigate it. I've done both of those things. I've been places where I'm like, I really need some social interaction. I'm gonna meet people. And then I've done, I had visits where I'm just like, I'm tired of interacting with anyone. So really you just kind of dictate how you want to interact with people. So pros and cons, I've kind of touched on a few of them, but huge cost savings, meeting other travelers, especially if you're on your own or maybe with one other person. Also gathering insights on travel places. So whether it's the staff who work there or other travelers who have already gone places that you're going or who just love to travel and introduce you to places that you've never heard of. Like I never really thought about visiting Sri Lanka before I went on my round the world trip. And now I most definitely will be visiting Sri Lanka in my future because so many people have told me how amazing Sri Lanka is. So I was definitely taking notes from what people were saying. I had them email me itineraries. You never know what you're gonna learn about um, from your fellow travelers. 
And then also, like I mentioned, finding deals on tours, oftentimes it's going to be less expensive to go through your hostel than to try to just go do it on your own through a local tourist agency. Cons, these are all can-be's, right? If you don't do your research or if you know something ends up being an off-case experience, but it can be noisy, it can be messy or dirty. Um, you could be vulnerable to theft. I would say that's generally if you're not being protective of your belongings, right? So if you leave your laptop sitting on your bed, it might get stolen. If you keep your laptop in a locker with a lock that you should bring yourself, uh, it probably won't get stolen. Things like that. I never had any issues and I was staying in hostels for the majority of those 10 months. Uh, and then also one thing is just that it can depend on the luck of the draw, right? Like as many reviews as you read, you're not going to know, oh, like this one oddball person was just a weird book mate, right? There's nothing you can do about that. Um, but I will say generally, so these are all people who I met in hostels and ended up traveling with in later destinations, even sharing rooms with at times. So um, definitely some happy stories here. This was probably my funniest experience. This woman decided that 8 a.m. in a 14-bed dorm was her greatest time to do yoga. Um, and it was like a very loud form of yoga, which I didn't know existed. Um, there's no audio here, but she was just like spinning. <laughs> I was like discreetly taping her from my bunk bed. But yeah, that was, that was my worst experience. It's really not a bad one. It made for a funny story. Okay, so my non-negotiables, I just figured I'd go ahead and share those with you all. These could vary person to person, but this is what I used when I was choosing what hostel to stay at. Location, is it convenient, is it safe? Typically, most of these factors are gonna have little sub ratings on sites like Hostel World. So if somebody put, if, if the average rating for location was horrible, I wasn't gonna stay there. If they didn't have free Wi-Fi, I wasn't gonna stay there. If they didn't have lockers, I wasn't gonna stay there. They needed to have English speaking staff, they needed to have no history or mention whatsoever of bed bugs. Um, bed bugs are a thing in some hostels, and I read a lot of horror stories about how hard it is to get rid of them and how people would like dump their whole backpack and start over. I never wanted to deal with it. So if literally five years ago somebody said they had bed bugs, I didn't see it. And then finally, personality fit. This is really again going to be a case by case basis. Personally, I didn't really want to go to a party hostel. That's just me. Um, so if a place said party hostel, I probably wasn't going to say there. People are very forthcoming in their reviews, and oftentimes the hostels themselves will kind of characterize their personality in their description because they want to foster whatever personality is there, right? So I would just say think about what you want in a place and then be mindful of that as you're reading reviews. A few other considerations down here at the bottom. Bedding. Most places I would say include bedding now, but sometimes you might have to actually rent bedding for just like $2 a day or something like that. Back when I was backpacking like 10 years ago, I actually carried a sleep sack with me with sheets. Uh, I didn't end up using it. I literally came across it a couple of days ago and it was unopened. Uh, but yeah, it's just something to be mindful of. Breakfast, whether or not it's included. Kitchen access, whether or not that's important to you. And then event and tour offerings. Again, you can just consider that when you're making decisions. All right, so I wanted to share a couple of uh, specific scenarios that or experiences that I had in um, hostels that I visited. These are all from my most recent 10 month trip. This one in particular I was excited to share because I felt like it would really challenge people's stereotypes about hostels. This was a stunning building, very historic, beautiful architecture, and then juxtaposed with really neat paintings, wallpaper, very bold, colorful, cheery. Um, this was in Santiago, Chile. I actually stayed in two different room types here. I stayed in a six bed mixed dorm, which was 11.50 a night, and uh, included breakfast with eggs to order. This was a pretty uh, awesome offering because sometimes breakfast is just like, you know, a loaf of bread and some jam, which, hey, it works. But when there's eggs to order and like fresh fruit and pastries and things, it's very exciting. Um, so that was up there in the corner. And then there were, this is an example of lockers. Sometimes they weren't this big. This, I could probably fit my whole bag in this locker, but it's really just important that your valuables fit inside the locker. Again, bring a lock with you. I recommend finding ones that have a flexible, um, I don't really know what you would call the part that kind of sticks out of the locking mechanism, but it's nice because then it'll fit in kind of any situation that you want. You can put it on your bag while you're moving it from place to place. 
Uh, and I recommend the combination locks, not key locks, just because then you won't lose your key. Um, ideally, a four number combo lock is more secure, but mine's three. Okay, so the other room that I stayed at in Santiago, um, I was traveling with a friend at this point, so we stayed in a two bed private room, which means you know she and I knew that we were gonna be the people in the bedroom, it wasn't gonna be a random stranger in that room. It was $40.60 total, so we each out the door spending a little over $20, still not bad, um, but I couldn't afford to do this for 10 months, right? So you just have to pick and choose kind of what your priorities are. It might depend on who you're with or where you are, or hey, I need a respite from a 10 bed room, so I'm gonna do this private room for one night sort of thing. Um, all right. So moving on to Pai Thailand. So this is an example of a time when I was weighing my priorities and despite the fact that this, the fit of this hostel, or sorry, the personality of this hostel was not the best fit for me and I knew that going in, I mean, how can you pass up this scenery? I literally was like, I have to stay there. I don't care if it's a party hostel. It looks beautiful. And it was a party hostel and I dealt with it. It was loud, I had earplugs, um, another thing you could bring with you. But I mean, this is where I ate breakfast. This is where I washed my hands. Like it was an open air situation. The beds were bamboo frames. It was really cool. This was $5.84 a night for a 12 bed mixed dorm and it included breakfast. Then in China, um, I stayed in a six bed mixed dorm for $9.37 a night. Um, I only took pictures of the common room here, but I thought it was a really cool common area. Lots of personality. This is a hundred year old door that was just in the common area. And although I don't have pictures of the room itself, I do have pictures of some folks that I met there. So this woman here, um, she lives in Beijing, but I met her in Shanghai. She was traveling and we struck up a conversation and she actually ended up inviting me to stay with her in Beijing. So this was actually at her apartment. Her girlfriend cooked me this amazing dinner, this like a huge spread that they cooked for me, and I just stayed there overnight. It was one night. It was kind of like a DIY couch surfing, basically. Um, but you never know who you're gonna be. And they even outfitted me with some warm clothes because it was cold in Beijing, and I didn't really research that in advance, and I was really cold. <laughs> so do your research on the seasons in advance. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to show you kind of a contrasting situation in Singapore. Um, Although it was probably the most expensive dorm room that I stayed in at $16.93 a night for a 14 bed female dorm. Um, it just wasn't glamorous. It, there was nothing wrong with it. It just wasn't very nice, but Singapore's expensive and I didn't really want to pay for a more expensive place. So, I mean, it worked. It's a place for me to sleep. I ended up spending more time there than I anticipated partially because they had free snacks 24 <laughs> seven. Um, it was literally like toast, but it had Nutella and jam and peanut butter and it was really nice. Um, okay, any questions about hostels? Yes. Um, when, you're, when you're traveling, like, do you book that hostel a day of? Or Great question. So personally, I always wanted to know where I was, I always wanted to know where I was going to sleep that night, the day before. So. Even though my trip was very flexible, I didn't want to commit to being someplace on a certain day, I felt confident enough saying the next day I'm going to be in such and such city. Okay. So I at least would book one night knowing that I would be able to stay there and then hope that I would be able to extend if I liked it. That immediately bit me though when I wasn't able to extend because the, the beds were all full. Yeah. So you have to kind of build your rhythm and depends on how long you're traveling, depends on if you're with someone and you're willing to relocate two people, you know, that sort of thing. But it's totally up to you. You totally could show up someplace and say, where am I going to sleep tonight? But it might not be as nice. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it did. It, it just kind of depends. And, and you'll develop that rhythm as you get more yeah. experience with it. Any other questions about hostels? OK. So helpful apps and sites. There's a lot of stuff here that I'm not going to get into a ton of detail about, but I just wanted you to have this. And I'm happy to send the slides to folks like with the sign-in sheet and everything. Um, so as long as you signed in, I will send you these slides. Um, but basically, here are some big categories of search engines to look out for when finding flights. I always start with Google Flights. You can check out some of these other ones. Momondo and Skyscanner are ones that a certain blogger that I follow, Nomadic Matt, he's a big fan of. 
Um, ultimately, I always recommend, unless there's a huge price difference, to try to book with the, the airline itself because generally it's just, it's more set, right? Like if, if something happens, it's way easier to deal directly with the airline than it is through a third party. So something to consider. Student Universe is the website that um, our uh, assistant to the Dean, Joey, recommended. I've never used it, but he said it has, um, it has student discounts. Basically, you verify that you're a student and then you get a price break on flights. Accommodation, I've touched on some of these, but other ones to look out for are Agoda, which I'd say is more popular in Asia, Booking.com, and also if you're staying in hotels, Priceline has a name your price tool. I've never used it, but again, Nomadic Matt really stores by it. These are other sites that I've only used one of these, but Nomadic Matt says they're great. Um, so a few things that they, that they do. Um, so Viable is a sort of tour aggregator, it seems like, that offers more niche tours. Um, Go Today offers uh, last minute tours and hotel deals. Um, let's see. The, main, the Man in Seat 61 um, has routes, times, prices, train conditions. That can be interesting to review, like what is this train gonna be like? Maybe before you even book it. Um, Blah Blah Car is a ride sharing site. So kind of similar to couch surfing, right? Like proceed with caution, but a pretty cool situation to explore. And then Gumtree he described as like Craigslist for travel. So you can find travel partners, ride shares, jobs, secondhand gear, homestays. So just check these out. The worst that can happen is you're like, no, that's not for me, right? But um, definitely nice to, to try. And then more uh, sites and apps. These are kind of what I thought about when I was looking through my phone and thinking like, what apps did I really refer to a lot? I will say that having a smartphone really changes the game when it comes to backpacking. It's just so much easier with all of this at your fingertips. Um, I will say, so starting with communication, WhatsApp is definitely the go-to app for communicating with people from all over the world. So if you're at a hostel and you wanna stay in touch with someone, maybe meet up with them in another city or something like that, they're gonna say, oh, what's your WhatsApp number? Like, that's a thing. Um, on Skype, you can actually purchase credit so that you can call landlines. It doesn't come up very often, but every once in a while you may need to call a landline. And if you have like a $5 credit or $10 credit on Skype, you're able to do that from your phone for pennies on the minute. And then cell service wise, I have heard that T-Mobile has great service globally. I use Google Fi, which not many people have heard of, but it works in like 180 countries around the world without changing my SIM card. It does require that you use certain models of phone. So maybe like the next time you're looking to change your phone, consider whether this might be a good fit if you anticipate long-term travel in your future. You could also look into buying local SIM cards. It's something that I've never done before, so I hesitate to really give you many details, but I would just say like Google local SIMs if you're thinking about spending a long time in one country. Um, also, if your parents are really freaked out by all of this stuff, like my parents were, an app called Life360 really made my parents feel a lot more comfortable. Basically, I shared my location with them and they always knew where I was. I think it updates every 10 minutes or something like that. So my dad was like, yeah, I can see when you were at that temple in Thailand. So, I mean, think about whether or not you're okay with your parents knowing where you are at every second, but I was. <laughs> um, moving on to maps. Offline maps are a really important tool. Google, Google allows you to download maps offline. Even if you're on airplane mode, it'll show your location on a given map. Cool tip that I didn't know until I was there. Maps.me is a fantastic app. It's basically like a wiki app where you can, or wiki map rather, where you can see what different people have labeled through a city. Or let's say one use that I really enjoyed was I was on a bus and I, we rode past something. And I was like, that looks really cool. I want to check that out. I would just drop a pin so that I could come back to it at any point. It was a really great uh, resource and one that I found out about by speaking with someone at a hostel. GPS My City I haven't used, but I've heard that it's another great resource as well. Moving on to destination info, Lonely Planet has a lot of offline uh, city guides that are great for, I'd say, more mainstream destinations. TripAdvisor has a lot of forums, and they also have some city guides as well. Bloggers, just Google like blog post destination that you want to go. You'd be surprised. There's a lot out there, as well as Pinterest, YouTube. On Instagram, you can just start typing in hashtags, and then those will lead you to other hashtags, and then you can start following people, and they'll follow you, and you'll just 
start circulating a lot of information through that source. Also Facebook groups in South America, there were all sorts of groups that were like backpackers in Chile and Peru. Um, that one, Spanish speaking did help. I was in a few Facebook groups that were only Spanish. Um, I found out about those through hostelers as well. So don't underestimate the power of your standard social media. On to converters and translators. Definitely have a currency converter on your phone. I use one called XE. A unit converter, unless you're great at math and want to start translating uh, kilometers and Celsius and stuff like that. I was always putting them in my phone. Google Translate's really powerful. I also recommend looking up maybe some language specific apps if you're gonna be in a place for a long time. Just kind of trial and error with dictionaries. But I will say Google Translate saved me in China because people can literally draw characters on your screen and it'll translate into English. So really powerful. And then in terms of organization, Google Drive is something that I swear by in my everyday life, but I've found it very helpful when traveling. You can save documents offline. You can uh, update them when you're offline and then they'll be, you know, uh, resaved basically the next time you connect to Wi-Fi. TripIt is something that Rex has endorsed. I have not used it myself, but it helps you stay organized. You like forward your itineraries to this email address and it aggregates your info. Correct. Great. All right, any questions about any of these? Lovely, and then just quickly some odds and ends. Um, these are some things that you may not think to budget for that could sneak up on you. So vaccines, if you're going someplace off the beaten path, you might want to try to go to a travel nurse and see what they recommend for that location. Some places actually require that you have a yellow fever vaccine in order to get into their country. Um, and that's a one-time vaccine that lasts for your whole life. So then you receive this card, it's literally your yellow card, and you have to present it when you go into certain countries. Uh, and they literally won't let you in if you don't have it. So sometimes it's required. Um, and definitely do that research ahead of time. If you don't have your passport, again, definitely apply for that in advance so you're not having to pay rush fees, things like that. Visas, always do your research ahead of time. I made the mistake one time of not realizing that I was supposed to have applied for a visa in advance. And then basically, I think I just lucked out because it was a recent change that they used to be able to get it on arrival and it was recently changed to apply in advance and I was basically having a panic attack in customs because I thought I was gonna be turned away at the border of Uganda. It was very stressful, but I lucked out. Don't luck out, plan ahead. <laughs> Uh, luggage fees, again, they can add up. If you're uh, packing light, which I'll talk more about in a little bit, that'll help you save there. Bottle of water can add up, again, back to the water purification. ATM withdrawal fees can be as expensive as seven or eight dollars per withdrawal. And get this, they limit how much you can take out to like a hundred dollars. So I highly recommend, I should put this on the slide, but write this down, Charles Schwab debit card. They have a free checking account that immediately or quickly within a month refunds 100% of your ATM withdrawal fees anywhere in the world. So I use that once I realized how much I was spending on ATM withdrawal fees and it has been a really great experience. Um, also foreign transaction fees, look for credit cards or any card that you plan to use that has no foreign transaction fees. Those can add up very quickly. And if you're planning on going with cash, just know that it's going to cost money to convert your cash as well. They're going to get you somewhere. So. <laughs> Um, unless you do this, you know, no foreign transaction fee credit card. And then finally, packing light, highly recommend for so many reasons. You'll save money, it'll just be easier to move around from place to place. Um, if you're wondering how I lived for 10 months out of this, um, hand washing, rewearing, Febreze, um, <laughs> You really, you won't regret it because lugging around a huge suitcase is just not worth it and you're gonna pay more to check it when you fly places and things like that. Um, rolling things up helps save space using packing cubes. If you haven't seen those, it's a little like zipper pouch. It helps you stay organized. It can help compress things. You can get a set for like $15 on Amazon. Um, also, if you think about either buying secondhand clothes as you're going into a trip or just wearing clothes that you're not super attached to, you can donate them at the end and then have some extra space for souvenirs or just that you don't have to lug it around anymore. So something to consider. Cash versus credit, um, it's gonna depend on where you go and kind of how much research you wanna put ahead of time, how comfortable you are with putting money on credit cards. I don't recommend charging your vacation. I would only use credit cards if you're gonna pay it off immediately. But basically, 
you're going to get fees somewhere unless you plan ahead. Um, know that credit isn't always available. I'm a big fan of using credit cards when I can, but in so many places that I went, it just wasn't an option. Um, and even when credit is available, I always kept crisp USD available for emergencies. Sometimes they won't take it if it's in bad condition. So make sure it's like a recent year, I'd say like 2012 or newer, I think is what they're usually looking for. And like no rips, no stains, like good condition USD. I'd say at least a couple hundred dollars if you can and just make sure you keep track of it so you don't accidentally misplace it. Youth discounts are definitely something to take advantage of while you're young. Uh, under 25, you usually get a discount. And um, the International Student Identity Card is typically what some places will be asking for. They won't really typically accept your UCF ID to show that you're a student. They want this like extra layer of verification. It's as cheap as $20 if you don't get any insurance with it. I was doing some research online before this that you can buy travel insurance with the card. I have no idea what the quality of that insurance is, but for like $100, you can have it with travel insurance. So I'd recommend looking into that um, if you want some sort of insurance and maybe can't afford like a full policy or something that and then bringing Tupperware just a little fun one um, it'll help, help you pack snacks or I can't tell you how many times I've had free breakfast and free lunch courtesy of my hostel um, so as long as you're okay with eating the same thing for breakfast and lunch and simple meals you can make it work so that's all I have prepared thank you so much yes do you have any like just quick advice about timing and the fact that like you know you said you had to quit your job to travel for 10 months like how do you find the time if you are in other things to go out and do some of these experiences yeah so the question was about timing how do you find the time to do this it's a really tough question right so you have to decide what your priorities are is it worth it to you to do something like i did i know a lot of people think i'm completely insane for having done that um so you know thinking about when you're applying for jobs how much vacation time do you get um, is it a sort of thing where if you're working overtime, you can take comp time at a later point? Um, in so many other countries, they allow you to have a sabbatical and they just don't, like literally I would be people who are like, oh yeah, I'm on a three month sabbatical from my job in France. And I'm like, thanks, <laughs> <laughs> I had to quit my job. Um, so there's really no perfect answer to that. I will say that it's easier to do while you're young, right? So like when I took this trip, I, when I first dreamt up this trip, I didn't have a partner. Um, I didn't have a mortgage, I didn't have a car payment. So like I parked my car at my parents' house, I left at the end of the lease, you know. So there are things that when you're younger, it's just easier to do. So I would encourage you that, I know that it's tough to get the pennies together at that point, but there's something to be said for the time and the lack of commitment for the things holding you down. Also, before you have so much stuff, once you accumulate so much stuff, it can be hard. Yes? You said you've done some solo travel, correct? Yes. What's your favorite place you've done solo travel to? Vietnam. Vietnam. Vietnam is stunning. You also find out kind of what's important to you. I've realized that natural beauty is my priority, so just landscapes and hikes and things like that. So Vietnam has such a wide range of landscapes. I traveled from north to south. Um, it took a month. I would, I could easily spend two months there. I would not spend any less than two weeks there. Even that, you should only spend time in like the very north part. But yeah, highly recommend Vietnam. I could talk to you for like an hour about Vietnam. Yeah, and I put a lot of posts on my Instagram about Vietnam. So I literally have like daily summaries. So feel free to check it out. Any other questions? Yes. How did you travel around like lo locally or do you take trains and stuff? Great question. So that really varies by destination. So I would say in Europe, trains are really popular. I also know that one of those sites I put up here, um, Flixbus has become really popular. Um, I, when I was in Western Europe, I had a Eurail pass. So definitely look at, like when you f come across these bloggers and such, they'll mention things that are specific to that location. So a Eurail pass was a one-time fee that was pretty expensive, but it allowed me to take kind of any train I wanted during that month in Western oh. Europe. Um, but really, once you are in those places, you'll have a better sense of what's the main mode of transportation. Like in Vietnam, I took buses everywhere. Overnight buses were a really popular thing because it's just a very long country. So is there a particular place that you're thinking about? Mainly Europe. Europe. So I'd say uh, train, 
as well as bus. And then actually take a look at budget airlines because you'd be surprised like I flew from London to Dublin for ten dollars. Oh, wow. Now that's with no luggage. That's with literally a personal item. So I think at that time carry-ons were free because this was ten years ago and the whole airline industry has changed. But um, and they will weigh your bag and they will measure your bag. So watch out. It's not like in the U.S. where you can just like sneak a huge bag into carry-on. <laughs> like. Um, they are sticklers. They will charge you 20 bucks an extra pound. So literally anytime I was at the airport, I would weigh my bag and I had a, a record of how much my bag weighed to make sure I wasn't getting out of hand. So that, that picture of you with your suitcase, did you yeah. carry that suitcase around everywhere? Or? Great question. Um, so, yeah. so I actually transitioned in the middle of my 10 month trip. So originally I had a backpack that I would say was about this size that I would carry here. And then I would carry this bag on my front, which is a beautiful look, but a lot of backpackers do it. And then I would always have this bag, um, a purse, a crossbody cross body purse, so that it's not easy to snatch off your shoulder. Um, so that was my go-to. And then basically I, I got tired of carrying so much stuff on my shoulders. So when I was at home for about two weeks in the middle, I was like, you know, I'm gonna try this roller bag for the last third of my trip. So I transitioned to this roller bag and then I had my backpack for my day stuff, and then this for like the, I'm gonna leave this in the hospital, but I'm gonna carry this with me all the time. So, was the main point of your question just like, what gear did I have? Like, or how much? like on a daily basis, were you walking no, around? No, 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 no. Daily basis, just this purse. Oh, okay. So basically, I, if I'm moving from city to city, I'm carrying all of this. Yeah. If I'm moving from hostel to hostel, I'm moving all of this. Mm -hmm. But if I'm on a bus, I put this underneath the bus, I bring this with me and put it overhead or typically at my feet with the straps around my legs so it doesn't walk away, and I have this in my lap. Okay. So really it's strategic about what do you put in where, in what container, yeah. because if I had my snacks in this bag, they're not doing me any good. Mm -hmm. If I have my passport here and this gets stolen, I'm screwed. So you have to be strategic about what you put where. I will say a passport pouch is something that I highly recommend. It's a slim, basically like a slim fanny pack that I personally like the waist ones. You can also see them in a necklace form where you kind of tuck it under your shirt. Especially for women, I would say the waist one is easier just because the shirt one, like you're going to see it. Um, so I would always keep my passport there, my emergency money, um, copies of my passport if I had a copy of your passport is something you should always have in a separate location from your passport, um, as well as a copy of any credit cards you have so that if they get lost, it's easy to replace them front and back. Um, so these are just sort of logistical things that you'll want to think about beforehand. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. Anything else? I know that we're cutting a short on time. Classes start soon, but I'm happy to stay after. I'm happy to answer emails. We'll, try, we'll hand it over. Yeah, uh, let's give Jessica a hand.